Today is our penultimate, actually it's the last day, not penultimate, it actually is the last of us, the series on the book of Ephesians. Lastly, guys, I don't know if you guys have been reading through this and the tool I gave you about the six questions. Remember the six questions? All right. So for your Bible study, for your personal Bible study, it's important to, to begin to, to use this tool. How many geography, any people here who, who, who liked geography in high school? Okay. We are only two, three. Ay, 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 ay. Okay. All right. Do you know how many rivers there are in Nairobi? This is again useless information by Goi Makodinge. Do you know there are more rivers in Nairobi underneath than on top? Subterranean. Did you know? And we don't, we haven't named them. But there are different aquifers that start in Nairobi or right around here. That is why the Maasai called this place the place of cool waters. Because there were underground reservoirs and springs that have. So, so the rivers pass underneath over here. You didn't know? Your pastor knows a bit more about you. But this is geography. From two geography, physical geography. Why am I doing this? To be able to understand what goes on in your context and understand the geography because that influences how you perceive that particular place. It's like, likewise with the Bible. When you hear that the Arameans came and fought with Israel, do you know where the Arameans are from? No. Google that. You will find a map. It begins to give you an appreciation of that. And so when we ask you, use this tool. Who is the letter written to? Uh, who is the letter written by? Why is the letter written? Um, when was the letter written? Where was the letter written? And what was happening at that time? We'll begin to appreciate why, even in this letter of the book of Ephesians, Paul was saying what he was saying. We begin to appreciate that. So as we look at the summer series, we can see a thread specifically to the book of Ephesians as to why Paul wrote this letter. He was exploring the gospel story and how it was all captured in the person and life of Jesus Christ. And how we who believe should live it out as a body of Jesus Christ. The, the, the summarizing thing is God has revealed who he is through his son Jesus Christ and this should unify us and live in a certain way. Ephesus was his base. Uh, it's a city, an eastern, western part of present day Turkey. And this is where Paul established his missionary work once he was sent from the church in Antioch. Ephesus was ground zero for a majority of, of, the, of, of the worship of gods of both the Roman and Greek gods. It was a cosmopolitan city, a port city at that. Uh, and uh, lots of trade and commerce was happening there. We, we discussed this in the book, in the first uh, of our, of our summer series, the beginning of February. Paul established a vibrant and a strong ministry presence there. Uh, and we can read all a, a lot about this in the book of Acts chapter 19 and Acts chapter 20. Now, later on, Paul was arrested and imprisoned. And while incarcerated, I'd imagine he had a lot of time to think, to pray, to reflect. And it was at this time where he wrote a series of letters under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This letter to the church in Ephesus is what we call the book of Ephesians. Now, not like we see it today when we say this is the church in Langata. If we say the church in Langata, we'll say the church in Langata in Rubia. Uh, Onyonka, a church in Langada in Uru Gardens, uh, a church in, uh, in where, where is else, this other place? Eh? Yes, Ngei, Otiende, okay, prisons, but you know, if you have all these particular ones, they all together were called a church. Understood? Alright? So, uh, so, so he wrote a, ch a letter that would be read in all of these small assemblies together. As we started this sermon series, just to give us a recap, we started off with chapter 1. Seeing how God has blessed those who believe in Christ. 
with all spiritual blessings. Even before the foundation of this earth, God blessed you. You who have chosen to believe in Jesus Christ, there were blessings already available for you. And to this regard, he prayed a very powerful prayer for the church in Ephesus. He prayed for wisdom and revelation. For them to know Christ better. That their eyes may be enlightened to know the hope that they are called. And to experience the resurrection power of that the resurrection power that was in Christ when he was raised from the dead. Chapter 2. We see Paul making a case that we were all doomed. Doomed in our sin. And we were doomed to the wrath and judgment because of our sinful state. Wrath and judgment of our Lord because we serve a holy God. But God by his grace and mercy guaranteed, reconciled, accounted for and commanding eternal plan for those who believe in Jesus Christ. And this plan again is realizing the person, the life, the death and the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. For it is by grace, he says, you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works. You cannot do anything for God's grace. You can't. You can't impress God. Believe me, you can't impress God. He is not impressed by you. So that he can bless you. No, he already has done this. So it's not by works. So that nobody can boast. Chapter 3, we learned three things. Firstly, Jesus was the fulfillment of this grace plan. Secondly, that this plan was for all humanity. And lastly, that his intent was that now, through the church, you, the church, God's manifold wisdom should be made known to all rulers, authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose accomplished in Christ Jesus. Last week, we finished with covering most of chapter 4, chapter 5, and chapter 6, all to verse 9. We've seen what, if this is what God's plan was, then how should those who are in God's plan look? What is their DNA? How should they look like? We identified six themes in this. And we said we need to live a life worthy of our calling. Operate in the giftings the Lord has given us and grow in our faith. So today, guys, allow me to explore with you the last few verses in chapter 6. For some reason, we Christians, especially African Christians, if we talk about the book of Ephesians, it is these last 24 verse, 14 verses that we remember in the book of Ephesians. Okay? Because it talks about spiritual warfare. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay? Uh, it's just about our African spirituality and all this. And we cannot assume, guys, we cannot assume that those who are under God's grace plan will not face challenges. Uh, this is a, a, a spoiler alert. There are going to be many scriptural references today. So if you're writing notes, okay, I am titling this sermon, Let's Get Ready to Rumble. Now, so for those of you who, who know, I've had my background is in boxing. I like boxing, you know, and all that. And when they're calling people to fight, they say, let's get ready to rumble. Yes. So, guys, if we are going to go in this grace plan, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, wait for it, will be persecuted. So this final part of the letter to Ephesians is actually spoken more in a cautionary tone, so to speak. It is telling the reader that anyone on this grace plan should prepare to fight. And he goes back to the writings of the prophet Isaiah, prophesying about the Messiah. This is what Isaiah prophesied in, 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 in chapter 11. About the Messiah, chapter 11, verse 5. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness, the sash around his waist. Chapter 49, verse 2. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword in the shadow of his hand. He hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me 
in his quiver. Chapter 59 verse 17. He, pe- he put on righteousness at his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. Using the imagery, this imagery, and I would imagine uh, uh, for the benefit of those who are looking uh, for knowing that he was incarcerated, he may have had a soldier guarding his prison. He writes this in verse 10 of chapter 6. I'm reading from the New International Version. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can make, you can take your stands against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, whenever you see the word therefore, ask why it is therefore or what it is therefore. All right? So it says, therefore, in view of all this, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and even after you have done everything to stand. Stand from then with a belt of truth buckled around your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place, and with a feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying. For all the saints. Pray also for me. Paul continues to ask. That whenever I open my mouth. Words may be given me. So that I will fearlessly make known. The mystery of the gospel. For which I am an ambassador for the chains. In chains rather. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly. As I should. And then he closes with greetings. Tychicus the dear brother and faithful servant. In the Lord. Will tell you everything. So that you may know how I am and what I'm doing. Uh, evidently here, Tychicus is the one who delivered this letter to the church. I sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know and that he may encourage to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and love and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ. His undying love. It is a given. Because we are a sinful people who live in a sinful world that is ruled by an enemy who is full of sin, the Satan, then this grace plan will be undermined. But how are we to overcome it? Three ways. The first one is show up for the fight. Show up. He says, stand. Verse 10 and verse 11. Stand. Show up for the fight. Strong and mighty in God's power. Stand for truth and the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stand for what is right. Stand for justice. Uh, Stand for the shalom. The peace of our society. Stand. And after you've done all you can, verse 13 says, stand. Show up. Show up. Number two. Know what you are up against. Who or what you're up against. But no. So guys, remember my story of how I went into a boxing match not knowing my opponent's strength. Remember that boxing story I told you guys about? Yeah? I went into a fight. For those who aren't here, um, you could get this, this, uh, this story if you follow the, the, the Salmon series. But for those who aren't here, I was a boxer when I was much younger. <laughs> and I got into a fight. I was the best boxer, so I thought, until I met my match. And I lost the fight. I was knocked out. Round two. I never went back to boxing after that fight. And I blamed my coach, because my coach did not know the strength of my opponent. And that's, and that's my story. Okay? That's my story. It was not that he was... I think if I knew, maybe it would have been a different story. But nevertheless, okay? But a main reason why I lost that fight was we did not know our opponent. 
Here Paul is telling his readers that the tsunami of all opponents is coming our way. This time, as I talked on sermon number one of this sermon series, remember Jose the bone crusher, that super champion boxer? No. This one is bigger. This one is bigger. It's worse. It's not flesh and blood, guys. You cannot perceive this opponent with your five physical senses. You cannot. These are not just spiritual individuals. There are also powers, systems, laws in the spiritual realm where you don't hang out much. (laughs) And they are waging war against this grace plan. That we read in chapter 2 and chapter 3. They are waging war. And they will take down anything in their way. They take advantage of the sinful world and they know that we are also sinful. Left to our own devices, we will self-destruct. Let me give you an example. When you see a sign, wet paint, what do you do? That is your sinful nature. Ten ten Danger, 10,000 volts. Stand away. We want to go and find out if it's 10,000 volts. Electric fence. The, you want to touch the fence. Why? 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 That is, that is the rebellious nature in you. Some of you are laughing because you touched wet paint yesterday. It's okay. Alright? But this is what it is. And the enemy knows your sinful nature. And then lastly, I said show up. Know who you're up against. Then put on the armor of God. In verse 13 it says, in other words, whatever you have now, whatever you have now, Ain't gone, ain't gonna help you. Ain't gonna cut it. Somehow we will need to use what God has given us through His Son Jesus Christ to face this formidable opponent. And here brings us the six things. Maybe seven. Now I'll bring one ahead of the other because I think it is most important. The helmet of salvation. Salvation, guys, is what separates the men from the boys, so to speak. It separates Champions League from Ligindogo. It separates those who are serious and those who are just You know, Kierere. The fact that you are in Christ, Scripture says, you are a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, this gives us a a guaranteed inheritance in Christ Jesus. And we read this in chapter 1 verse 13. It says, "And and you were all included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of salvation, when you believed you were marked with him with a seal the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. Let me explain. There is the filling of the Holy Spirit and there is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Before Christ's resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit would come and fill an individual to do some good exploits, great exploits, for God. And we see that all through the Old Testament. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit now comes into the believer and resides. That's why in 1 Corinthians 3, 16 says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, wait for it, and God's Spirit lives in you. So that's the difference. Again, I told you guys, you're going to be celebs in heaven. Because Joshua did not have the Spirit of God living in him, dwelling in him, like those who are post-resurrection. David did not have that. The prophet Isaiah did not have that. These people did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, yet believed. And it was credited to them as righteousness. I'll be coming to that in just a bit. We're waiting for this salvation. So put on 
the armor of God. Put it on. Put on salvation. Paul made this same point to the Romans in his introductory words saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for those who believe. Hallelujah. Hey, hey. Salvation is for us, guys. Second thing is truth. He goes on and uses the analogy or the imagery of a what? Belt of truth. Guys, I am persuaded that in our Christian community, this virtue is not appreciated that much. In fact, it is not exercised much. We don't tell people the truth. We don't tell them the truth enough. We extend more grace to their, I'd say, at the expense of the truth. And let me explain. If somebody has done something wrong or has failed, we wonder how they will receive it when we tell them that they are wrong or when we've confronted them with the truth. We are easier, we are more amiable to be saying, ah, wachana nae, or let's extend grace to them. But truth, guys, needs to be administered in the community of faith. It must. It is powerful. Jesus even told his audience in John 8.32, then you will know the truth and this truth will set you free. Jesus went on to, to make an audacious, audacious claim that he is the embodiment of truth in John 14 verse 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father but by me. Truth, guys, is not to prove someone wrong. Because I want to suggest to you, that is what the activists in this country do. The difference between you and the activists is this. Truth is not so that you can show the other one that they are wrong. Truth is not to assert a position or to shame somebody else. Truth is about to bring peace. To bring a shalom. A a holistic where our, your fellow neighbor is enriched with this truth. Where your fellow neighbor is blessed by this truth. Not at their expense, but for your joy. And for the glory of God. On the other side of the grace plan, guys, if you put it in a coin, one side is grace, the other side is truth. Another one is righteousness. Paul calls this the the breastplate of righteousness. I had alluded to this earlier in in this sermon, and I also talked about it three weeks ago. That this, this word righteousness in English, is a, a, a more abbreviated, it's not a, 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 a good translation, but in the English language, hey, that's what we most speak, but it is translated as, righteousness has two words um, that alludes to being right with God and being right with your neighbor. You get me? Alright? So when you see that in, in this, this particular verse, he's alluding to that. To be right with God and to be right with your neighbor. To be right with God is this. The the truth is that there is no other route to be right with God but through Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And with Jesus again, God made him who had no sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. We also are called to a life of justice. To be right with those who we are in touch with. To be right with our neighbors. The prophet Micah even says this in Micah 6.8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what is right. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. 
Righteousness, guys, is not just a status you acquire. It is a lifestyle, good people. A lifestyle you live under this grace plan. Peace is another. Paul uses it and says, fit your feet with the gospel or the readiness of peace. And Jesus was very particular about this peace. This peace that he talked about, he said, I leave with you my peace that I give you. I do not give as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. John chapter 1, 14 verse 27. Why would Jesus say this? And why would he distinguish his peace from others? I suggest to you, it is not a passive thing. Peace, when it comes to those under the grace plan, is not a woye woye thing. Peace is for gangsters, guys. And I use this liberally in our colloquial language. I mean, you have to be gangster if you have peace for Jesus Christ. Why? It is, it is active. It is, it is actually proactive. And let me show you how gangster this peace was. Jesus was the peace offering between God's wrath on us. And he put himself in our place. That's gangster, guys. Scripture says it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of God. So Christ, the real OG, came and took the wrath away from us. He became our peace. God made him who had no sin to become sin for all of us so that we may become the righteousness of God. This peace goes to where there is war. This peace goes to where there is strife. This peace does not run away from problems. This peace confronts problems. This peace advances a message. This peace reconciles people. It doesn't... In fact, this peace sometimes churches fights. (laughs) And let me explain to you. This peace stands in between a raging mad, we read this in the book of Matthew, a raging mad Peter, the disciple, who accosts Malchus, who was one of the soldiers who came to arrest Jesus. And in this scuffle, he takes out his knife and he cuts off Malchus' ear. Okay? You know what this piece does? It rebukes Peter and heals Malchus, by getting the ear back, putting it back on Malchus' ear like this, and then saying, okay, Malchus, you can arrest me. How much more gangster can that be? It's like me standing and telling you, give me your best shot. Just just punch me, boo, and you don't move. This is the peace. Listen to how Paul describes it to the Philistines. Philippians chapter 4 verse 7. It transcends all understanding. Experiencing this peace might not even understand it yourself. Knowing the way that I don't understand. This is God's peace. You who might be experiencing saying, what? So powerful is this virtue that God calls one who has this peace a peacemaker. Notice, not a peace lover or a peace keeper. Jesus actually affirms them by saying, blessed are the peacemakers in Matthew 5, 9, for they will be called children of God. Hey, hey, hey. Ooh-wee. It's getting hot. Faith. Mm. Faith. The shield of faith. Guys, faith is the, the fuel that runs the engine of the grace. Because without it, Hebrews eleven six 6 says, what? We cannot please God. Guys, not to hit on Mercedes Benz owners here. But one day I was driving and I saw Mercedes Benz. Hmm? KC Z somewhere there on the side of the road. And a guy with a can 
All right? A fuel can. In fact, it was a boda. All right? A boda who had brought the fuel can, okay? All right? And putting fuel in the Mercedes Benz. For those of you who's been driving for long, sindio hiyo ni aibu for a Mercedes Benz owner. Hiyo ni aibu, sindio? It's the same for a believer. Not that I'm prophesying that you'll have Mercedes Benz. The pastor didn't say that. If we do not have faith, we look bad. It doesn't please God. God calls us to believe. And we're always called to believe. Putting our faith in God is what activates these things. We saw that in chapter 2 and verse 8. It is by grace through faith. This is the agency. Faith is the agency that what we see becomes. You see, we call things that are not as if they were because we believe. Genesis 5, 16, 15, 16 said, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Paul even expands this truth in Romans chapter 4. And let me read it for you here. It says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him. So shall your offspring be. Verse 19, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead since she was about 90 years old. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God being fully persuaded that God was able and had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Faith. Belief. Believe. Even Jesus says, if you even just have, just like a mustard seed, this is the fuel that runs the grace man. Two more things, guys, then I'm out. The word of God. I kid you not, guys. And I say it again here. I don't say it enough. This word of God, guys, is truth. It's the real stuff. It's the real deal. It's the most reliable. In fact, it's the only reliable truth about God. You hear somebody is prophesying there. What does scripture say? Go back to the word. I don't know why, guys, we are running to all these prophets and ministers. I don't know why. But if you just practice literacy, somewhere in the book of Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, you will find this truth that you are looking for. The answers that you are seeking. The breakthroughs that you want. Right here, guys. Right here. It is available to us today. Right now. It is inspired This is inspired by God. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, and correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man or woman of God will be thoroughly equipped. It was in the beginning. And in the beginning, it was with God. And it was God. This truth, this word, this word, sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing through, dividing soul, spirit, joints, and marrow, judging the thoughts and attitudes of every one of our hearts. Nothing in all creation, guys, is hidden from God's heart, sight or from his word. Nothing, nothing, nothing is hidden from this truth in the word of God. Everything is uncovered before God and laid bare before his eyes, guys, of, of, of him or any one of us who needs to give account. The word of God is truth. And it sanctifies truth. Jesus said, your word is truth. Sanctify us with your truth. Sanctify them with your truth. When he was interceding for the disciples. The word of God is a light unto our feet. A lamp unto our path. Giving us direction. It should not depart from our mouths. But we shall meditate on it day and night. 
careful to do everything that is written in it, then our ways will be prosperous and successful. That is the truth about this word. If we are going to face this formidable or formidable, depending if you went to primary or primary, if you want to face this enemy, do it here. Because that's what Jesus did. Don't think you are going to take the enemy down without the word of God. If Jesus did it, who are you? Lastly, prayer. These guys, I don't want to say much because it's a given. Prayers for those under the grace plan, guys. Hey, James says they are are powerful. They are powerful and they are effective. It is a way to engage with God. It's a, it's a two-way street of communicating with the Lord and He communicating with us. It's an, it, it, this is not just an action. It is a, a lifestyle. And most of us guys, we, we emphasize prayer in spiritual warfare. But guys, there were five, six other things that I've mentioned about spiritual warfare that we don't. We want to cast out demons. Yeah! And use whatever language we want. Some of us even start having accents like they went there. Father God. Yes, God. Hallelujah. Putting ours where they don't need to be. God bless you. Glory. We're under the spirit of God. You have a rough voice when you're praying. Why? Why? That's, that's it. Where is the helmet of salvation? Is this true? Are you believe, are you living in righteousness? This is the thing. I am not discounting prayer. Pr- prayer encompasses all these things. Yet Paul tells us in, in six other ways as opposed to just praying. Prayer, guys, is a lifestyle. It is a posture of the heart declaring our total dependence on God. I used past a friend I used to have when we were much younger. I used to say, is prayer your spare wheel or your steering wheel? <laughs> I used to tell him, he's both. Sometimes more my spare wheel. Oh Lord, I need help. Pray, guys. There are different kinds of prayers, intercessions, petitions, or what we'll call supplications. Those are you know, for those of you who are lawyers, they, they put in petitions. You are actually putting in a, a prayer. See, you know, the legal people here they tell me, yeah, you're actually putting in, they say, my prayer to you, my Lord, with a small L, yes? My prayer to you, my Lord, is that you do this and that. that. That's what a petition is. That's what we're saying. We need to petition God and the heavens. Their pleas, their confessions, their praises. Whatever we do, guys, we should and must engage in prayer. We are giving you an opportunity to do that. That we are doing it collectively, guys, as a, as a community, as a body of Christ. And hopefully, this can be a template for you to continue using daily in your own personal devotions to God, learning how to pray. Guys, it's not that we know how to pray. We don't. One day, we will figure it out when we are face to face with God. Before the throne of majesty. But for now, let's do anything to engage our God in prayer. This is a spiritual discipline that is vital for our spiritual growth, formation, and sustenance. Guys, this is spiritual warfare. This is how I believe the Lord has shown me what spiritual warfare is. It's not something out there. It's who we are. We gotta be gangster for Christ, guys. Because if we're going to walk in this grace plan, we will face opposition. Shall we pray? Sanctify us with your truth, O God. Your word is truth. Speak to us again and again. And Lord, call us as you have called 
your people time in and time again. To understand, Father God, what we are getting ourselves into. But Lord, we will be people who show up. And we know what we are up against. But Father God, walk with the confidence that you are already gone before us. That we learn the disciplines of putting on the armor of God every day. Walking with the truth that indeed salvation is for all of us who believe. If anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. That Lord, you're calling us to a life of truth. And the truth is, Father God, we need you. But Lord, we are not holy and righteous, but we are made holy and righteous in your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our peace, stood between your wrath and judgment for our sake. So today, Father God, we want to reaffirm our faith in you through your Son, Jesus Christ, who was revealed to us through your word, that you, God, love the whole world, that you gave your one and only Son, that whoever shall believe will not perish but have eternal life. So our prayer is that, Father God, you'd give us grace to walk this grace plan. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I'm under no illusion that there could be people here who have never given their life to Jesus Christ, never understood the grace plan of God through Christ, but it's made sense to you today or through this sermon series, even those who are watching for us and following us online. Maybe this is an opportunity to make that step. Affirming your faith and say, today I choose to believe in Jesus Christ. Is there any? Put up your hand, put it down and I'll pray. Won't embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. I pray, Father God, even those who are under the sound of my voice. Father God, even those online, I ask that, Father God, your truth will continue to compel us to live a life of holiness and righteousness before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We've come to the end of our service today, of the sermon series. We'll be starting something new uh, next week, at least uh, giving you something different from what we have been doing and thank you very much uh, if you have any questions please don't hesitate you can hit me up uh, and uh, with uh, on, on my phone send me a whatsapp message and just you know if you have any questions about this sermon series you are most welcome allow me to pray a blessing over you so please do stand up and allow me to pray a prayer of blessing on you right from the book of Ephesians Father God, I pray for your people here at NCLA that out of your glorious riches you may strengthen them with power through your spirit, their inner being. That you, Christ, may dwell in each one of their hearts. I pray that them being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep the love of Christ is for them. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that they may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So I pray to you who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we can ask, think, or imagine. According to your power that is at work within us, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And God's people say, Have a great week, guys.